to the church at Thessalonica, he did something that had never been done before. The New Testament letters are no ordinary pieces of correspondence. They're the product of the Holy Spirit moving through specially chosen authors to communicate spiritual truth to believers, not just in a particular time and place, but to believers in all generations. The New Testament letters are letters from heaven. From 2011 to 2013, we traveled together through Matthew, Mark, Luke, through the Gospel of John, through the book of Acts, and now we're going to begin opening the New Testament letters one by one to see what the Holy Spirit wants to say to us through them. And we're starting with the book of 1 Thessalonians because it is the first letter from heaven written by the Apostle Paul. So look with me in 1 Thessalonians 1. We're going to start reading in verse 4. And let's listen to what the Holy Spirit wants to say to us today from this letter from heaven. 1 Thessalonians 1 and beginning in verse 4. Paul says, For we know, brothers loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake, and you became imitators of us and of the Lord. In spite of severe suffering, you welcomed the message with joy given by the Holy Spirit, and so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia, the Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, for your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we don't need to say anything about you because they themselves report to us what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turned from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Let's pray and invite the Holy Spirit to minister to us. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your presence here. We thank you for your powerful word. And Father, I pray that you would come. The letter kills, but the words you give our spirit and life. Speak living words. Breathe life into us today. In Jesus' name, if your heart agrees, just say amen and amen. Well, what to do with people who are content to hang out indefinitely on the fringes of the faith. A chicken and a pig were walking down the street one day and they came across a diner. The sign outside on the road said, bacon and eggs, $1.99. And below that it said, help wanted. The chicken said, hey, pig, they need help. Let's go in and help them. The pig snorted and said, that's easy for you to say, you'd only be involved, but for me, it requires a total commitment. <laughs> In the Greek city of Thessalonica, Paul found himself preaching to a bunch of chickens. Acts chapter 17 records Paul's visit there during the second missionary journey. And when he arrived in Thessalonica, he found the Jewish synagogue and he began preaching about Jesus. He showed them from the Old Testament scriptures how the Jewish Messiah had to suffer and die and be raised again from the dead. And he proclaimed to, to them that Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah. Luke says that Paul preached this message for three consecutive Sabbaths and something amazing happened. Some of the Jews were persuaded to believe in Jesus and more than a few prominent women of the city. But most of all, Paul, uh, Luke says in Acts that a large number of God-fearing Greeks were persuaded to commit their lives to Jesus. Now, God-fearing Greeks were people who were living indefinitely on the fringes of the faith. They were Gentiles who were intensely interested in Judaism. They participated in Jewish worship. They loved the Jewish prayers. They studied the Jewish scriptures. But they couldn't quite bring themselves to fully commit to Judaism. They were chicken. For a lot of Greek men, the obstacle was circumcision. It was painful and embarrassing. The Greeks considered circumcision to be unmanly, and that was a problem. 
Another obstacle was the Jewish kosher rules. It made it hard if you became a Jewish convert. You couldn't celebrate holidays. You couldn't share family dinners with non-Jewish family and friends. All the way around, becoming a convert would make life more difficult in society, so they opted to just hang out on the fringes. Can I tell you that there are still a lot of chickens around today? People who are genuinely interested in spiritual things. They like hanging around with God's people. They love the sense of family. It, it makes them feel safe and uplifted. They enjoy the music. They enjoy the singing. They like the moral compass that their kids get. But they don't exactly want to become one of us. You know, Jesus freaks, Bible thumpers, ho holy rollers. They're involved, but not committed. Sympathetic, but unsold. Interested, but keeping a safe distance. What to do with God-fearers who are reluctant to become Christ followers? What Jesus wants to do is he wants to turn their whole world upside down. When Paul brought the gospel to Thessalonica, the chickens who had been hanging out on the fringes for years suddenly committed to a life of faith that turned out to be far more radical than Judaism. What the Jews had been unable to accomplish in a whole lifetime of teaching, Paul accomplished in just three weeks, and these God-fearing Greeks became Jesus freaks. The Jews were livid over Paul's success. In a jealous fit, they ran out into the marketplace and they found certain, the King James says, certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and they paid them to whip up a mob. They went to Jason's home where Paul had been staying, and when they didn't find Paul, they dragged Jason and some of the other new Christians in front of the city council. And they said, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here now, and they're preaching Jesus. You know, it wasn't true at all. Nothing much had really changed in the world. Rome was still firmly in charge of the civilized world. Caesar was still emperor. The magistrates still governed Philippi. The politarchs still governed Thessalonica. The gospel hadn't turned the world upside down yet. But what it did turn upside down was the personal worlds of people who were previously noncommittal about their faith. So what happens when Jesus turns your world upside down? Looking at Paul's words in 1 Thessalonians 1, I find five things, and I want to share them with you quickly this morning. Five things that happen when Jesus turns your world upside down. First, this. When Jesus turns your world upside down, you have a dynamic encounter with the Word of God and the work of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus wants to turn your world upside down, he sends a messenger. One who brings both the word of God and the work of the Spirit. Paul says in verse 4, he says, Brothers, here's how we know God has elected you. Here's how we know you got it. Here's how we know that you've received salvation. When we preach the gospel to you, we could feel God's power at work. The Holy Spirit was actively present. There was deep conviction in the atmosphere. You know, I can relate completely to the scene that Paul is recalling here because I have been on both sides of this experience. I've been the person receiving the message that moved my heart with the deep, convincing power of the Holy Spirit. And I've also been the person delivering the message, keenly aware that the Holy Spirit was at work in the room. You know, last Good Friday at the Palace Theater, 145 people got up out of their seats and came down to ask Jesus into their heart before we lost count. <laughs> Beloved, can I tell you, there is nothing else in all the world like the gospel. The gospel is a divine message about God, and it is a divine moment with God. It's sacred content that is accompanied by supernatural conviction. It's holy information that causes a heavenly transformation. The gospel is the good news that Jesus Christ has done for us what no other Savior, so-called, has ever done nor could ever do. 
God himself left the splendor of heaven. He put on a body of human flesh. He came to earth as a man. He became something substantively that he previously was not. As a result of the incarnation, God was forever changed. Jesus humbled himself and he became a servant. He showed us what God is really like. He relieved the poor. He released the captives. He restored sight to the spiritually blind. He rescued the oppressed. And then he laid down his life for the sins of the world. The spotless Lamb of God died on a cruel cross suspended between heaven and earth. And for one awful moment why Jesus hung there with the sins of the world upon him, the Father turned his face away from the Son. And an eternity of perfect, unbroken, intimate fellowship in the Godhead was shattered. God himself experienced the sting of separation and death that sin brings. The author of life tasted death. And he did it all to rescue us. And he rescues us and rescues us and rescues us. Beloved, no other Savior called by any other name, worshipped anywhere in the world, has done what Jesus has done. And salvation is what happens in that divine moment when you hear that message. And even though you really don't understand how it all works, you know somewhere deep inside of you it's true. You know it's right. You know you need it. You know you have to have it now. Salvation is what happens in that moment when you joyfully receive the message that so many others reject. Paul said to the Thessalonians, you welcomed the message with joy. Actually, he makes a, a joke in verse 9. He says, people are talking about the reception you gave us. Everybody knew about the reception he got in Thessalonica. It was a riot. Stop them. They're promoting a king called Jesus. But these non-committal, God-fearing Greeks experienced the word and the work of the Holy Spirit, and they opened their hearts and they received Jesus. When did Jesus turn your world upside down? Paul recalled the Thessalonians' moment. Can you recall your moment? For me, it happened one night when I was eight years old. I was alone in my bedroom, had gone to a... Pentecostal church service for the first time ever. And that night alone in my bedroom, I prayed a prayer to God. It wasn't very theologically accurate, but it came from my heart. And I simply said, God, I want everything you have for me. Can't tell you my bed shook. Can't tell you a light shone from heaven. I can't tell you I heard a voice from above, but I can tell you definitively that the presence of God came to me in that moment, and he has never left me since. What about you? When did Jesus turn your world upside down? You know, one of my favorite stories belongs to Patty Yuva, Pastor Nick's wife, and I asked her last night to share it with us. We caught it on video. Take a look at the screens at Patty's story. Hi, Harvest Time. I'm Patty Yuva. I'm going to give you a very quick testimony of how I got saved. I got saved in 1975, uh, Labor Day weekend. I was 18 years old. My oldest sister, Anna, got saved the summer of that year. And she was in, uh, insistent that my parents invite us or allow these people that brought her to the Lord to come to the house. And my mom finally gave up and said, OK, fine, she can come and, and um, talk to us. So on that Labor Day weekend, we were very upset. The girls were very upset because we were looking forward to our nice long weekend. This couple, a, a sister and a brother, she was 27, he was 25, they came over to our house. And when we heard them coming in, we took off to our room and we were hiding in my parents' room, actually. And so we couldn't really hear what was going on in the living room because we were chatting amongst ourselves and, and we, couldn't really, we could hear there was conversation, but we couldn't hear what was going on. About an hour later, my sister, my youngest sister, Gina, 
all of a sudden stood up and said, you know, I feel like I gotta go in there. My sister Takani said, I think I'm gonna go check out myself and see what's going on. And she got up and she left. And she said, I'll be right back. And she left, but again, she didn't come back. And eventually my sister Julie said the same thing. She's like, I feel like I gotta go check and see what's going on. So she got up and left. Now I was left in the room and I'm like, all of a sudden I'm feeling like I wanna go see what's going on myself. So I did, I opened the door and as I stepped into the threshold, into the, over the threshold into the living room, I was sapped and I was like, somebody put a, pulled a rug from under my feet and I landed on my knees. And there was uh, in the room, the presence, uh, there was like a, uh, it was like, where, like when you see with dirty glasses, it was like a haze, the whole room was covered in a, in a haze. It wasn't smoky, it was just like a haze. And I could see my sister Julie was flat on the floor, out cold. My mother was on, the, on a corner on the floor, leaning against the couch, out cold. My sister Gina was another side, out cold. My sister Connie was in front of me, out, and speaking in tongues like crazy. My dad was in another corner, um, kneeling by the end of the sofa, just with his hands up in the air, just crying like a baby. Now you gotta understand, my dad never went to church. Even though we were Catholic, my mom took us to church, but my dad never went. He was an unchurched man, never really talked about God, never did anything. And there he was with his hands up in the air, crying like a baby. Now I could not stand up. Whatever the presence was in that room was holding me down. So I crawled my way to my dad because he was the only one awake. I crawled my way to my dad and I, I, he was shaking like a leaf. We were just shaking and shaking and crying like crazy. And I, all I could say to my dad is, what's, what's going on? And my dad returned in the same way. He goes, it's God's presence, because that's how we could talk. That was the only way we could, you know, we could, it just, that's the way it sounded. But we, when we made our way up, then they, they explained to us what had just happened, how the presence of the Lord had come in and radically come into our home in a manner that they had not even experienced themselves before. And they led us to the Lord. We all, uh, we all prayed the, uh, the sinner's prayer. And... It was just an amazing transformation for us. God knew that we needed something uh, uh, extreme to change us from our mentality, and He gave us extreme that night. And uh, to this day, I still feel the presence when I talk about it because it was just so amazing, so incredible. It's been an amazing journey, 39 years of an amazing journey, and I'm so thankful for that night, and I can tell you, so much more that it will take days for me to finish, but in a little capsule form, that's my testimony. God bless you all. What happens when Jesus turns your world upside down? It is a dynamic encounter. What happens when Jesus turns your world upside down? The second thing I find is you turn away from your idols. You turn away from your idols. Paul was sure that salvation had come to the Thessalonians because of the power that was present while he was preaching and also because of the change he saw in their lives. One of the things he observes in verse 9 is that they turned away from their idols. Across the harbor from Thessalonica was the sacred Mount Olympus, the home of all the Greek gods. Spiritual pilgrims from all over the world traveled through Thessalonica on their way to that mountain. Idolatry was a massive part of the life of the city. Holidays revolved around the idols. It was big business in Thessalonica. It was fundamental to the economy of the city. Turning away from your idols in Thessalonica surely came at a great cost. You know, at first glance, it might not look like we have very much in common here with the people of Thessalonica, but I want to tell you that actually idolatry is very alive and well today. It's totally bizarre, but more and more Americans are turning to actual worship of Eastern idols and spiritual objects, go walking through stores and all of a sudden there's Buddhas and there's Hindu gods for sale everywhere you look. But much more commonly, most of us are still chasing hard after the same earthly possessions and pleasures and protections that the ancient idols were believed to bestow. People worshiped idols because they believed it would give them wealth, health, physical strength, sexual 
prowess, longevity, food, wine, intelligence, popularity, power, position, protection. Can I tell you that people still idolize all of those things today just without the statues? An idol is anything in your heart that's ahead of Jesus. This is some good preaching from Pastor Tim Keller in New York City. He wrote, sin is not only doing bad things, it's more fundamentally making good things into ultimate things. Sin is building your life and meaning on anything, even a very good thing, more than on God. Sin is primarily idolatry. You know, the absolute tragic thing is whether it's a statue you worship or the earthly pursuit behind it, Paul says, it's all a dead end. It won't bring you joyful life here, and it won't bring you eternal life in heaven. One day, a rich young ruler sought out Jesus. He desperately wanted assurance of eternal life. Jesus examined him and found that he had very diligently kept all of the Jewish commandments, except he was lacking in just one. The very last one, covetousness. The rich young ruler loved his money. He loved the security and the position that it brought him. And in the course of breaking the 10th commandment, he inadvertently broke the first. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. He was an idolater at heart. And he couldn't bring himself to turn his back on his idol. He was genuinely interested in Jesus but he couldn't bring himself to commit. You know, what's your idol? Might be money too, or it might be something else completely, but whatever it is, when Jesus turns your world upside down, your innate response is to turn away from that idol. My roommate in seminary was an ex-cop from Alabama. His mom passed away when he was a boy, and Scott grew up to be an absolute hellraiser. He was known all over town as an angry kid, a drinker, a brawler. And he liked one particular girl in their town, and the only way that he could even be within 100 feet of her was he followed her to the Pentecostal church one day. We call that missionary dating. <laughs> to his utter dismay, he had an encounter with the Word of God and with the work of the Holy Spirit. He said when the altar call was given, he literally climbed over pews to get out into the aisle and get down front to surrender his life to Jesus. In the weeks that immediately followed, everything in his life began to dramatically change. He was an avid gun collector. He had many, many dozens of guns. He had vintage guns that were passed down in his family. He had guns that had historic significance. He had military guns, automatic guns. His collection was worth thousands and thousands of dollars. One day the Lord spoke to him and said, Scott, I want you to lay down your arms. He made an appointment with his pastor and he said, Pastor, I've brought an offering and he started carrying in the guns, armload after armload of guns, glocks and rifles and shotguns. He said his pastor was praying in tongues the whole time he was carrying the guns in. Can I tell you, there's nothing wrong with owning guns, there's nothing wrong with collecting guns, but for Scott personally, surrendering his guns represented turning his back on his idols. And when he did, he said all the anger inside, his brawling spirit, th that drive to defend himself, protect himself, that inclination that he had to strike first rather than to be struck, he said it all left him when he laid down his arms as the Holy Spirit ordered. You know, I just feel a word from the Holy Spirit for somebody in this place today. It's time to stop fighting God and lay down your arms. It's time to surrender to Jesus that thing, whatever it is that you've been holding on to. Jesus said, if any man wants to be my disciple, he must deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. I ask you in your pursuit of Jesus, what have you denied yourself? What pleasure, what pastime, what plans that you've made for your life? What rights have you surrendered to his leadership? You see, when Jesus turns your world upside down, it just comes naturally to do that. 
What happens when Jesus turns your world upside down? A third thing I find is that you become an instinctive imitator of Jesus Christ. You become an instinctive imitator of Jesus Christ. Another observation that Paul makes in verse 6 is that the Thessalonians instantly became imitators of Paul and of Jesus. Now listen, this kind of imitation is not learned behavior. Paul was only there for three weeks, so the Thessalonians didn't have time to pick up all the Christianese from him. The kind of imitation that Paul is talking about here is the kind that grows inside of you from the Holy Spirit. You know, I've witnessed this beautiful transformation hundreds of times, and I never get tired of seeing it. When someone who's been on the fringes of the faith has an encounter with God and they become hungry for the word. Desperately, they, they, they just read, they, they can't get enough of the scriptures, reading the word, hearing the word. When they become a worshiper, when they become a lover of God's presence, when their prayer life comes alive and it's not drudgery anymore, but it's something dynamic and exciting. When someone becomes a lover of his brothers and sisters in Christ and a lover of others, Jesus promised that the Holy Spirit would help us to remember everything that Jesus taught. You know, that doesn't mean that we can quote all of Jesus' words verbatim and give the chapter and verse. Instead, what it means is that in every situation, the Holy Spirit will help me to act in a way that's consistent with all the life and all the words of Jesus. In every situation that I encounter, the Holy Spirit will help me to know what would Jesus do, and he'll help me to do that. But the imitation that Paul has in mind specifically here in 1 Thessalonians 1 is joyful suffering for the gospel's sake. Jesus came to bear witness to God's truth, and he suffered for it. Paul came to bear witness to Jesus, and he suffered for it. Jason and the other God-fearing Greeks in Thessalonica believed on Jesus, and they suffered for it. In fact, Paul said their suffering was severe. They were derided, mocked. They were falsely accused of sedition. They were ostracized. They were put under economic sanctions. They were blackballed out of business. And yet nothing that the Thessalonians threw at them could quench the joyfulness inside of their spirits because it came from the Holy Spirit. Beloved, I want to tell you, when Jesus turns your world upside down, the rest of the world will not be happy with you. Your friends will wonder, what's up with you? Why don't you come around anymore? Your family will be very uncomfortable with the new you. They'll demand the old you back, you know, the one that they were so nice to. People you don't even know, they'll give you a hard time if they know you're a Christian. You ever notice that you can pursue any kind of spirituality under the sun and no one will say boo to you? You can sit folded up like a pretzel for an hour. You can carry crystals around in your pocket. You can feng shui your little heart out. But commit your life to Jesus and the whole world will come after you. Pastor Raymond Mui, who was just with us two weeks ago, shares about the night that Jesus turned his world upside down. He was an orphan raised in a Taoist missionary uh, a monastery in Malaysia. He was a very angry, very out-of-control kid. And when he was in junior high school, one of the classmates invited him to go to a Pentecostal church. And he went and he loved it. He loved the songs. He loved the prayers. He loved the fellowship. And from his Taoist training, he, he believed that religion was about heaping up a large quantity of rituals. So he started going to that little church every service, every Sunday morning, every Sunday evening, every Wednesday night. He said he carried four Bibles with, them, with him, never read any of them. He said one of them was a Jehovah's Witness Bible, and no one in the Pentecostal church even noticed. He, he didn't have any idea what he was doing. He just thought that religion was about doing more, doing more, doing more, doing more to please God. He attended that little church for a couple of years. 
And the Taoist nuns who were raising him didn't care because they were at their wit's end with him and, and didn't know what to do with him. Until one Saturday night, an Assemblies of God missionary, Fred Seward, came to preach a revival service at Pastor Raymond's church. And during that service, he had a dynamic encounter with the Word and with the work of the Holy Spirit. And in that moment, Jesus turned his whole world upside down. He said the church couldn't believe it when he came down to the altar to respond to the salvation call. They already thought that he was saved because he was the best Christian in the place. He said when he started home, his heart was overflowing with joy. He said he felt like he was walking on air. And when he got to the gates of the Taoist monastery, for the first time ever, they were locked shut. Through no means of human communication, the Taoist nuns knew that he had committed his life to Jesus that night. And when he refused to renounce Jesus, they turned him out on the streets at the age of 16. But you know, for Pastor Raymond, there was no turning back because the anger that had been in his heart for all those years was gone and he was full of joy unspeakable and full of glory. See, once Jesus has turned your world upside down, you instinctively imitate Jesus and Paul and Jason and the Thessalonian believers and Raymond Mui in suffering for the gospel's sake. What happens when Jesus turns your world upside down? A fourth thing I find is you become a ready role model for others. You become a ready role model for others. Another observation in verses 7 and 8 is that these imitators immediately became great role models. Beloved, can I tell you, new believers make great leaders in the body of Christ. Oh, they might not be ready for ministry offices just yet. They might need a little teaching, a little training, a little grooming. But I want to tell you, the fresh faith and the fresh grace in their lives re-energizes the entire body. He said, you, you brand new Christians, you imitators, you became role models for all the other believers. They began sharing the gospel all over Greece. Paul said, I haven't even had time to go brag about you, uh, about what God has done, because people keep coming up to me with news reports about your faith and about your zeal. See, when Jesus has turned your world upside down, the word that you have inside of you is enough to turn other people's worlds upside down too. Paul wrote, I'm dying to get back to you so that I can supply you with the teaching that you lack. He had only been three weeks in Thessalonica. He had only had time to give them the very basics about Jesus. The Thessalonians hadn't been to Bible school. They hadn't been to seminary. They hadn't been through all the discipleship courses at Harvest Time Church. But the word that they had inside of them was enough to lead other people to Jesus. And beloved, the same is true for you too. Don't worry about what you don't know yet. Just tell people what you do know about Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit inside of you will do all the convincing that's needed. That's good preaching right there. When Jesus has turned your world upside down, your testimony is like a trumpet. Jesus said, you shall receive power. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you shall be my witnesses. Jesus didn't say you shall be my theologian. He didn't say you shall be my apologist. He didn't say I need a defense attorney or a prosecuting attorney. He said I just need you to be my witness. Just tell people what happened to you the moment Jesus turned your world upside down. Tell them what your life was like before. Tell them about your encounter with his presence. Tell them how your life has changed since. And while you share your story, the Holy Spirit will touch people's hearts in the indescribable way that only he can. What happens when Jesus turns your world upside down? Last thing is this. When Jesus has turned your world upside down, you serve God and wait on Jesus. You serve God and wait on Jesus. Worship team, come help me if you would. Paul's final observation in verses 9 and 10 is that the Thessalonians have become servants of God and waiters on Jesus. 
Revelation says that in heaven we will serve God forever. Man, wasn't worship awesome this morning? I, I, I got to tell you, I, I can't wait until we join the angelic hosts of heaven and the saints that have gone before us and we sing, worthy is the lamb, worthy is the lamb, worthy is the lamb. You, you get just a little, just a little taste of heaven. We'll serve God forever in heaven. We don't really know what our service will look like over there, but we do know what it looks like over here. Over here, we serve God by serving one another in the body of Christ. If you passed out bulletins today, you served God. If you ushered, you served God. If you taught a Sunday school class or children's church, you served God. If you changed diapers in the nursery, you really, 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 really served God. If you gave in the offering this morning to support the ministry of our church, to advance the gospel on earth, you served God. Worship team, you're serving God this morning, and you're doing a great job. If you were patient with your brother or your sister today, you served God. If you were forgiving, you served God because God regards our treatment of one another as our treatment of him. That's good preaching. Over here, we serve God by serving others inside the body and outside the body. If you love someone this week, if you encourage someone, if you help someone for Jesus' sake, then you served God. You know, when Jesus has turned your world upside down, that, that kind of serving, it just comes naturally. It's just innate. It's inside of you. You can't help yourself. You serve God and you wait on Jesus. Paul is talking in these closing verses of 1 Thessalonians 1 about waiting for the second coming of Christ. That is one of the major themes of 1 and 2 Thessalonians. And we're going to talk about the second coming of Jesus. But the kind of waiting that Paul is talking about is not passive patience. It's active endurance. Maybe we could think about it this way. It's like the difference between waiting for the cable guy to show up at your house or going out and running the Tough mutter race. Anybody ever waited for the cable guy? Yeah, he'll be there between 9 and noon a month from now. You're waiting for the cable guy at home and you, you check your watch and watch your windows. Check your watch, watch your windows. Check your watch, no cable guy, no cable guy. The clock is ticking on. That is passive patience. But that's not at all what Paul is talking about when he says we wait on Jesus. Waiting on Jesus is active endurance. It's more like running the Tough mutter race up hills and over walls and through ice cold water no matter what's in your way you just keep pushing forward pushing forward pushing forward towards that finish line people endure the tough mutter in order to get a t-shirt and bragging rights but we actively endure in life in order to get rescued by jesus and as we actively endure waiting on him, he rescues and he rescues and he rescues and he rescues us. So what to do with the chickens? What to do with the God-fearers who are reluctant to become Christ followers? There's only one thing to do, and that's to have Jesus turn their world upside down with a dynamic encounter so that they'll turn away from idols, become instinctive imitators, ready role models, serving God and waiting on Jesus. Beloved brothers, we know that God has elected you to salvation because our gospel came to you, not simply with words, but with power, with the Holy Spirit, with deep conviction, and you became imitators of us and the Lord. In spite of severe suffering, you welcomed the message with joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers. And the word of the Lord rang out from you. Your faith has become known everywhere. You've turned from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven. Jesus, I you. Come on, give the Lord one more big praise in this place. Thank you, Lord. 
down. You know, it happens differently for each one of us. God is a good father and he knows how to give good, good gifts in just the way that we need to receive them. I was alone in my bedroom. Maybe you were by yourself and the light of Christ shined into your heart. Maybe you were with a friend at a kitchen table in a car. Maybe you're at a home Bible study. Maybe you came to an altar at a church. But can you point back to that moment that you remember that you knew that you knew you didn't understand it all, but you just knew it was true. You knew you had to have it. Do you remember that moment? Listen, Paul, Paul wrote to remind them of that moment because they needed encouragement. They were going through it. And they needed to remember that wonderful day. When you remember, listen, when I remember that night in my bedroom when I was eight years old, it's just as fresh of it as it happened yesterday. If you can point back to that moment, just celebrate it in your heart. Recall it. Give thanks. Be strengthened. Be encouraged by it. But maybe you're here this morning and there's, there's not a moment that you can point to. There's not a specific time that, that you can recall. And, and you want what we've been talking about. You want Jesus to come and turn your world upside down. Can I tell you, if you ask him, it's a prayer he will most certainly answer. He'll come and he'll turn your whole world upside down. I wonder if there's someone here this morning you say, you know, I'm not sure there's a moment that I can point to, and I want God to turn my world upside down. If that's you, I want to just pray with you that God will come and do it. If you're here today and you say, God, I want you to come turn my world upside down, and you want to pray with me for that, I want you to just, while heads are bowed, lift your hand up real high wherever you are. Come on, there's one, two three, come on, four, five, come on, someone else, I want, I want to, I want the Lord, there's another one, six, I want the Lord to turn my whole world, come on, lift up your hand high, there's another one, I want the Lord to turn my world upside down, thank you, Jesus, come on, somebody else, hey, I promise you, he'll answer it, he'll come in his own sweet, special way, he'll come when you're at the most unexpected moment and overshadow you, and his beautiful presence will come. He'll rescue you. Come on, someone else. I want him to come. There's someone else. Someone else. I, I want, I want a, the Lord to turn my world. There's somebody else. I want the Lord to turn my world. Come on, let's all lift up our hands all over this place, everybody. And I'm going to lead us in a prayer, just inviting God. Some of you, it's been a little while since he turned your world upside down. You could use a little fresh turnover, you know. Let, let's, let's pray that he'd come do it again that he'd come turn our world upside down. I'm going to lead out. I want you to follow after me. And God's going to come and do something extraordinary right now in this place. All praise, all honor, all glory to Jesus. We magnify you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for coming. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for bringing deep conviction right now. Lord, thank you for bringing powerful transformation. God, you're encountering people right now in this moment. Thank you, Father. Come on, lift up your hands. I'll lead you follow. Let's pray. Father, thank you for loving me. Father, thank you for sending your only son. Jesus, thank you for coming. You lived for me. You died on the cross for me. Jesus, I believe you are the son of God. I believe, I believe you rose from the dead. From the dead. I, confess I confess with my mouth. Jesus is Lord. Jesus, is Lord. Jesus, Jesus I'm inviting you inviting to come turn my world upside down. I'm inviting you to come with a dynamic encounter. I want your change. I want to be cleansed. I want to be rescued. I want to be a new person. Jesus, come and wash me. Jesus, fill me with the Holy Spirit. Turn my world upside down. Jesus, I'm turning to you as my Lord 
and the leader of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, give the Lord a big praise. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Listen, if you prayed that prayer for the first time today, when this service is over, we want to invite you to come right up to the altar. We want to pray with you. We want to celebrate with you. We have something we want to give you that's going to help you uh, to just get started on a new life with Jesus. So I'm going to ask every one of you to be seated for just one moment.